Yeah. How do the, the components of uh, medical marijuana differ, say, from CBD? Sure. So, um, you know, marijuana, the plant, uh, produces many, many different substances, uh, chemical entities, um, uh, sometimes referred to as cannabinoids. So the most commonly um, uh, known cannabinoids are, of course, as Rob mentioned, Delta-9 THC, which is the primary psychoactive component of the plants. Uh, CBD or cannabidiol is another major constituent of cannabis plants by weight. And there are a number of others, up to 100 or maybe more minor cannabinoids that are produced by these plants um, through sort of sequential actions of the enzymes that ultimately end up producing THC and CBD. So there's lots of chemicals um, that are produced, most of which we don't really understand their effects in terms of the biology. We understand the most about Delta-9 THC since it was discovered to be really the, the primary uh, component of the plant that causes the subjective effects in humans and sort of the intoxication and all the other things that go around go along uh, with cannabis consumption. So CBD and THC are different molecules. They act at different targets in the brain. They're structurally very similar, uh, but have distinct properties in sort of biological systems like the human brain and body. What about Delta-8? It's really a close structure to Delta-9. Does it bind to the cannabinoid receptors that Delta-9 binds to? So what we do know is that Delta-8, it's, it's structurally very, very similar to Delta-9 THC. There's just one, uh, I mean, you're the chemist there, you can talk a little bit about this, but their double bond has just moved over on one of the rings a little bit. So it's very, very similar. Um, and uh, as you might suspect, uh, given the marketing, uh, it actually does bind to the cannabinoid type 1 receptor the same way THC does um, in, in theory. Although uh, it's, not as, it's not nearly as potent as Delta-9 THC. So the amount you need to take to exert the same effect is actually anywhere from three to 10 times. So you would need to take up to 10 times more Delta-8 THC to potentially get the same effect you would get from the Delta-9. There's also some evidence that it may not exert quite as much action at the receptor. So not only do you need to take more, but even if you take more, it may not have exactly the same type of punch that the Delta-9 does. But it does interact with the cannabinoid type 1 and 2 receptor, uh, which makes it distinctly different from cannabidiol, the CBD. Uh, but as you mentioned, it can be synthesized quite easily with a little bit of a, some organic solvents and some acid and some heat and a few other things that you could convert these large amounts of CBD that come from hemp plant plants into Delta-8. But as you mentioned, there may be a lot of other molecules that come along for the ride when people are synthesizing or trying to make this transformation um, with that. And are there are there differences between the marijuana that people consume today and what they were, say, consuming in the 70s when there was a, yeah. a lot of attention drawn to this? Right. So as Rob mentioned, you know, these the, the plants have been cultivated, um, you know, through uh, by humans um, to essentially select for uh, different strains that people might find uses for. So on the one one hand, you have hemp, which has essentially no THC or very very low amounts of THC, but very high levels of CBD or cannabidiol. On the other extreme, you have plants that have very high levels of THC these days. As opposed to maybe 20 or 30 years ago, THC concentrations in plants were anywhere from 1% to 3%. Now you can have THC concentrations as high as 25% or more. And that's been through cultivation uh, to select for the enzymes that preferentially will produce Delta-9 THC from these precursors and produce less CBD. And in general, there's a bit of a yin-yang where um, plants that produce a lot of THC will produce less CBD whereas plants that produce a lot of CBD generally have low amounts of THC. Rob, what's the difference legally between hemp and marijuana, and how does this play into the legality of CBD and Delta-8? So as I mentioned before, uh, marijuana is cannabis that has more than trace amounts of Delta-9 THC. Um, hemp is everything else. So hemp is defined as the cannabis plant when it has less than, I think, 0.3% by dry weight, Delta-9 THC. Um, historically, the law made no distinction between the two. All cannabis was marijuana. Um, there was no such thing as hemp. 
Uh, but in 2018, Congress did something interesting in a farm bill. Uh, in that measure, which was sponsored by uh, uh, Senate Leader Mitch McConnell, Congress legalized for the first time hemp. Uh, it made this legal distinction between cannabis plants with very little uh, Delta 9 THC, cannabis plants with lots of um, Delta 9 THC. Uh, and that's the reason why over the last few years, and, and lots of states follow the federal government's lead on that, but that's the reason why in the last few years, you've seen this explosion in the availability of CBD and also these Delta-8 uh, THC products. Um, you know, here in Nashville, you can drive down the street and you'll see coffee shops um, offering dabs and, and CBD in your coffee and Delta H by uh, THC. So even in a, a more conservative state, we see this stuff being offered. Uh, and the reason is that as long as the cannabis plant doesn't have much Delta 9 THC in it, um, you can go ahead and extract whatever you want from it uh, and sell it under federal law and under most uh, state laws. So you could have a hemp plant, doesn't have much Delta 9 THC in it, but it might have a lot of CBD in it. So you can extract that CBD legally uh, and then turn around uh, and sell it on the market. You know, you've talked about this endogenous cannabinoid system or endocannabinoid system. So what what's it actually there for? And how come we're not high all the time if we've got this <laughs> system that we're using? Um, sure. So that uh, you know, the, the system there in terms of the receptors that we mentioned earlier that TA, Delta 9 THC binds very well to that's situated throughout the brain and, and spinal cord um, of, of mammals and obviously including humans um, do, do a number of things and many of them are quite predictable. So uh, endogenously produced cannabinoid molecules in the brain act on this re uh, receptor to regulate things like appetite. Uh, not surprising given that's one of the effects of, you know, consuming these exogenous cannabinoids like Delta 9 and THC. Um, also important for things like mood regulation, uh, memory function. Um, so sort of those are the kind of big types of things that uh, cannabinoids are involved in. Regulation of stress response is something that all that studies extensively and how these cannabinoid molecules regulate uh, resiliency to stress and depression. Um, and things like that, which are, you know, very well cited reasons why people, certain subpopulations of people use cannabis chronically. So many of the things that these uh, endogenously produced cannabinoids act on the type 1 receptor to do are things that are partially mimicked by THC. And so the question as to why are we not high all the time um, is uh, complicated, but also uh, somewhat simple. So when people use THC, um, your brain um, and your body gets a flood of these molecules um, that activate the receptor sort of indiscriminately throughout the brain. Whereas normally these receptors may be activated only under certain, certain situations or only in some parts of the brain one at a time um, or at very low levels chronically. And so um, people are not necessarily feeling high all the time because of the sort of spatial temporal regulation of these normal biological processes. But when people take cannabinoids from the plants, it's like you're flooding your whole brain and body with these molecules. And they may be activating receptors that maybe normally are only activated under very certain circumstances. But now you've kind of flooded the system. And that's why you get these intoxicating effects, these robust effects on episodic memory and many other things.